Now we will have our first presentation given by Professor Krister Nilsson from Umeå University. He is our keynote speaker this morning and his, the name of his presentation is Three Decades of River Restoration in Sweden, Lessons Learned and Future Challenges. Welcome Krister. Thank you very much and uh, good morning. I would like to give you a short overview of my experiences of stream restoration in Sweden over the last three decades or so. But before we start actually talking about stream restoration, we need to go back in history because everything has a cause and the cause is often somewhere abroad. So I will bring you to Ironbridge in England, to the early 1700s. This is believed to be the cradle of the industrialization. What happened here was that there was a land reform. By that time, most people were farmers, as well as in Sweden and here in Finland. And the land they had got was very scattered, many small patches here and there. And they needed a lot of labor to manage their land. But in this land reform, they got their land gathered close to their farmsteads. And then they didn't need as much labor as before. So people became unemployed. They went to the cities. They were cheap labor in the factories. And the factories could start to develop and produce more products and new products. And they needed a lot of raw material. And one of those raw materials was wood. And they didn't get what they needed from England. They had to go abroad. So they approached Fenoscandia. And that started a huge wave of forest cutting. Formerly, forests had not been of any particular value. Wetlands were much more important by that time for farmers because they produced hay. But now the forests got a value. So lots of men were engaged in cutting forest, cutting trees. And they stayed in the forest for extended periods of time. They lived in cabins. And in case uh, women were involved, they worked as, as cooks in the cabins and cooked the food for, for the men. They used hand tools and horsepower. But the problem for them was how to get the timber down to the coasts where the sawmills were and where the ships were. There were not enough roads and in the mid 1800s there were no tracks. So they had to use the streams and rivers. And pristine streams and rivers are quite complex. They have a lot of obstacles. They have boulders. They have, they have large wood in them. They are curved and so on. So it took a long time for them to, to, to develop the streams and rivers to proper floatways. It was kind of a trial and error procedure. So they tried and they found out what was wrong and then they, they, they made changes. So in the Vindel River, for example, where I do most of my work, it took four years for them when they started in the mid-1800s to, to get the timber down. The final season, uh, 125 years later, it took just a few weeks. And that gives you an impression of the magnitude of the change. Um, what they did primarily was to, to move a lot of sediment Oops. No? Well, this one doesn't work properly. They removed a lot of coarse sediment from the channels to the edges of the streams. In case there were too much sediment, they 
they made simply made flumes. You have a flume in the middle there. In the small streams, they didn't have enough water. Then they made dams and reservoirs and collected the water, water and then they splashed it out and then they could float for half an hour or so. So those dams are usually called splash dams. And then they started to float the timber. And, and even in my childhood, they stuffed so much timber in the river so you could, you could walk over the streams on, on the logs. And that was basically the same men as the ones that worked with, with, with tree cutting. They cut trees in the winter and they, they worked with, with timber floating in the summer season and in the early autumn. Uh, there were a lot of dangers involved in this. For example, you see a log yam over there. Log yams were, were, were dangerous and they had to move the timber apart. Many people could drown and so on. There was a saying by that time that timber floating never dies. It will last forever. But suddenly it died. Happened just happened like that. And there are usually three causes why timber floating ended. And one is quite obvious that over the, the last decades they had developed a network of forest roads and in connection to that tracks had become more efficient and larger so it was cheaper to use tracks and, and, and roads to move the logs down to the coast. But there was also a third reason that's not very much talked about. And to understand that, you have to think about what a tree looks like. If you have a big tree like this, you can't get your arms around it. The, the marginal part of that tree, that's the live parts. That's where the fluid goes and so on. The inner parts are dead, dead wood. And dead wood floats like cork. So the big trees, they were very easy to float. But the more trees they cut, the smaller the dimensions became. And those small trees, the proportion of live versus dead wood, of course, increases. And that makes the floating capacity worse. So they lost a lot of timber. Timber just sank to the bottom and they couldn't retrieve it. So that was also a, an important reason why why they stopped timber flowing. <coughs> I, I got involved in a research project, a restoration project, 16 years ago, and we made many excursions to look at the former floatways, what they looked like, and this is what we saw. Over to the left there, you have a stream that's perfectly channelized. All the coarse material, coarse sediment, pushed towards the edges to make a straight canal. On top there you have a, a concrete wall that closes off many channels in a larger river. You have a dam in the middle there and as you can see it also has a floor of tiny logs to in improve the passage of, of the timber but it's a perfect obstacle for fish migration. At the bottom you have a stone wall that closes off a side channel. In the upper left you have a man-made canal. When the stream was too curved, they simply made new channels. You have a wall that stone wall that covers the riparian zone to stop timber from stranding in the riparian forest. It was also often covered with pine, pine trees. They, they used the dead standing pine trees that you in Finland are so good at making nice cabins of. Uh, <coughs> on the lower left you see another example. Pretty high wall to be able to work also during high flow conditions. It closes off a side channel and closest here you have a canal that's dynamited through a very nice <coughs> sculptured bedrock area with, with rapids. 
So they, they did a lot of impact to improve the transport of logs. In, in bigger rivers, they used uh, structures called wing dams to f concentrate the flow to the middle parts of the channel. And in, in connection to that, large areas of good fish habitat was laid more or less high and dry. So this is an example of a reach. It's a real reach and what it could look like. Prior to, to timber floating, this reach was quite complex. You see four different channels there, islands. When they started to float this reach, they used the, the right or upper channel and went down. And then with time, they shortened the, 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 the float way and used the left channel on the top there. And I don't know if this one works. No, not really. The lower channel there was the only one that was left, left unimpacted. And those reaches are very valuable as references when we try to figure out what channels looked like prior to, to timber floating. <coughs> then there were all those drivers of restoration. How come we have started restoration? That's also something that started somewhere abroad. And EU is responsible for many of those drivers. When EU was formed, they released the Habitat Directive in 92. It talks about good conservation status. And then in year 2000, we got the EU Water Framework Directive that requires us to restore streams and rivers to the best available ecological status. Sweden has, has presented 16 environmental objectives. Uh, so there are many drivers of, of stream restoration. And in the EU, they also started the Life Foundation in 1992. That one has developed over the years. So they give out very large amounts of money to stimulate uh, restoration in uh, especially Nature 2000 areas. A short summary of what was done during different decades. Most timber floating stopped in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and in some rivers they ended in 1980. But after that, there was basically no timber floating in, in Sweden. And then the floatways were abandoned for some years. But then in the 80s and 90s, especially the Swedish Forest Service started to do some restoration. We call it soft restoration because they didn't know the magnitude of the impact. They saw structures and they, they removed some structures partly and so on, took away some dams and so on, but they, they didn't do any extensive restoration. They, they simply didn't have, have the resources, the economic resources. Then in the in 2000, fisheries management organizations started to, to become more and more involved. And by that time, science has also got involved. Historians have had, had found out how big the, man, the, the impact had actually been. And they presented lots of ideas for, for the restoration manager, managers and they they start more and more extensive restoration. And in the present decade, the county administration boards have become more and more involved. So in my hometown in Umeå, for example, the county administration board there recently got 14 million euros just for one stream restoration project. So projects tend to become larger and larger. So fr from soft restoration in the beginning, we now try more and more uh, enhanced restoration. I don't think we have seen the end of that yet. As you see on this timeline, timber floating went on for quite a long time, from the mid-1800s to up to 
around 1970, 75. On my pet river, the Winder River, they stopped 75. Um, that was the first year I was a PhD student, so I was actually able to, as a young scientist, to see timber floating alive. Um, and then slowly restoration was taken up, and now it has speeded up. And but still, you see how short time restoration has been done compared to the long period of, of timber floating. I was involved in a, in a project uh, including the, the Pite and the Vindel rivers in Sweden. Those are two major rivers, basically free-flowing, and lots of, of agencies were involved as, uh, in, in that project. They provided money. Uh, in year 2010, I managed to get an, a grant from the EU Life Foundation for a project we call the Windle River Life, and that went on for almost six years. And we worked together. Umeå University owned and managed the project, but we worked together with the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and also with the Umeå Windle River Fishery Advisory Board. Those were the guys that did the practical restoration, and we also worked together with the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. So what did we do in this restoration project? Well, most time we tried to get the sediment back into the river channels. And for, for that work we used excavators, we used bulldozers as you see here. Uh, we took down floatway structures, and excavators are good doing that kind of job. They put the boulders back into the stream. Here you have an example. This is the same working scene as on the previous picture. You see the excavator on top there, and you see some remaining parts of a wall, and that's actually the same wall as on the lower picture. So the, the excavator driver has taken away most of the boulders, but he left the base of it, so when he's finished on the other side, he can drive the excavator back. And when he drove the excavator back, he took away the last parts of, of this wall, so there was a free passage to this side, side channel. <coughs> This is another example, a heavily channelized stream, a tributary to the Windel River. Um, the, lower, the upper picture is before the restoration, and the lower one is after restoration. If you don't believe that this is the same reach, you can look at the multi-branched birch tree on, on the left part of the of the picture, it's the same both on, on, on both pictures. And then you can also see that how close the water is to the base of the, of the birch tree on the lower pitch, picture compared to the upper one. So the, the width of the stream has expanded a lot and also the, the volume of water that's kept in the stream after restoration. So is this the natural state? Is this pristine now? No, it's not. In some places you can still find channels like the upper one there. And of course that's kind of extreme. At least for the local timber floaters here it was too extreme. So they didn't even try to clear it from boulders. Instead they built a, a, a flume on the side of the channel. But that gave us a very good reference for what it could look like previously. So you still see that it's quite a big difference between, between those two. And of course, in the lower part, many of the boulders have been destroyed because of this. The, Timber floating associations, they just love to blast big boulders by dynamite. And we have those what we call 
blasting roses in many, many boulders. In this case, they didn't even care to, to take the different parts apart. They just left it like that. But in, in, in most cases, they just created rubble of, of the big boulders. And of course, you can't not glue them together again. But there are other things you can do. So we suggested that in nearby forests, in bouldery regions, there are usually lots of big boulders. And I don't think for efficient forest management that the, the big boulders are actually needed. So I think it's a win-win situation. If we remove the big boulders, the foresters would be happy, and also the fish in the stream. So that's what we did. We used heavy machines to carry those boulders down to the streams, and then we placed them in the stream. This is not the, what it finally looked like. This is during work. But you, you, you get an idea of what kind of work we have done. And this was part of the life project. We call, they rec often require something they call demonstration actions. And this was our demonstration action to do enhanced restoration apart from what we call basic restoration when we just use the available material. But here we added new material <clears throat> and also tested the differences between basic and enhanced. Pristine rivers, they also, also include lots of wood. I mentioned that. And we, we did experiments about that as well. It's a lot fun. These big excavators, they just grab a tree and pull it out like you pull it a, a, a carrot from your common garden, <coughs> and then they place them over the stream. <coughs> I presented this idea in Switzerland quite a few years ago, and the audience, they just said, no, no, you can't put trees in the streams. They will float downstream, and they will jam up in front of bridges, and they will destroy the bridges. They were very scared about the idea. And I guess the Swiss streams might be a bit steeper than Scandinavian streams, but we were a bit, bit aware of that and, and a bit afraid that something might happen. But in most cases, the logs haven't moved at all, especially if you keep the root board that kind of anchors the, the logs. So what could happen is that some logs, they, if you place them across the stream, they could swing and end up along the riparian zone, but they won't move further. So they are very stable doesn't look nice in the beginning, but after about three years, they've lost their bark and they become nice and gray and they, they look like old growth forest. And then with time, they break up and they collect sediment and they form a lot of structure in the streams and they also provide habitat for various organisms. So wood in streams is a good thing. These are some examples, some more common examples of what we have accomplished. To the, to the left there you have uh, two reaches before restoration and to the right the same reaches after restoration. And you can easily see the difference. In these cases the landowners, they didn't want us to add wood, so we didn't add wood. <coughs> we also removed quite a few dams. And you see they provide obstacles. And removing dams is a bit tricky because the people, there's usually an upstream lake. And the people, they don't want the water levels to change. So we kept the water levels by building some veers across the, the stream. And then we spread out the fall over an extended area. So we created rapids that were easy to migrate through by fish. And in that way, we could also maintain <coughs> the bridges that are often associated with, with, with dams. What happens when you channelize a stream is that the finer sediment is removed, the spawning material. It just goes with the flow and it sinks to the bottom in deep pools, and it's very difficult to retrieve from there. So we bought new spawning gravel from companies 
that get it from upland eskers and so on. <coughs> we drove it to the streams during winter, and then in summer we created many, many hundreds of spawning grounds. And what you do is that you usually build a half circle of stones, and then upstream of that you place the spawning material. Because when the big fish go there to spawn, they lift up a lot of material, and if you don't have this half circle of stones, you might lose the, the stuff downstream. There is another method too in, in more slow-flowing rapids. You can have the, the gravel still intact, but in many cases it's been covered by less useful material. And then you can use hand tools to take it up to the surface. And that requires a lot of people to do that work. It's called the Hartjoki method because it's a stream in, in northern Sweden called Hartjoki where they developed this method. Apparently we did pretty well because we, we got nominated for a prize by the EU. So the 15% the of the life projects got that prize. So, so we, me and my, my project leader, Johanna Gardeström, <coughs> we went to Brussels a couple of weeks ago and, and picked up our prize. It was quite a nice, nice um, prize ceremony. But did things actually improve in the streams? I go through this quickly, geomorphically, hydrologically, and ecologically. Geomorphically, even a young child could say that there is a difference between these two. But even the geomorphology needs some time to settle. If you are a fisher, for example, if you try to climb those stones, you see that they are not, they are not really stable. They need time to to, to be fixed. Hydrologically, is there a, a difference? Well, in the pre-restoration case, you had a unidirectional, quite fast flow. But in the restored reach, what happens when a water molecule hits a stone is that it has to change direction, and then it loses energy. So if you have lots of molecules, water, the, 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 what happens is that the water level, when it loses, the molecules loses energy, the water level increases. So you get a slower flow and you get a deeper water. And that, that's exactly what happens. The restoration managers, they said that if we restored and went for lunch, when we came back, it looked completely different. So that effect is very sudden. Ecologically, we saw recovery in some streams, not in others. How come? Well, to answer that question, you have to know some basic facts that are required for, for a proper result. First of all, you, you need a well-designed restoration. We, we think we designed it well because we, we knew pretty well what was impacted and so on, and what it looked like before restoration. So I think we are okay there. We used the best available scientific follow-up methods, so I think we are okay there as well. We, we didn't follow up organisms that didn't change, because we focused on the most important ones, the riparian plants. Yeah, that's a very diverse group, and, and lots of resolution and the same for aquatic invertebrates, and we also focused on fish. So I think we are fine there as well. Of course you need an organism pool. You need organisms that can recolonize your restored areas. And that's a problem. So we get a red minus there. Because there is nothing further upstream that's pristine that could contribute organisms to your restored site because the timber floating association they started at the top of streams to do do timber floating and of course if there are no organisms to recolonize your restored areas it will take an awful lot of time for organisms <laughs> somewhere else to find their way back to your restored site so we need a lot of 
unless we are planning to move organisms there, we need a lot of time for things to happen and, and recover. Uh, I will just present briefly a paper we published in Ecological Applications recently. I had an Italian postdoc who studied aquatic invertebrates and she found an increase among those groups that are favored by slow flows and, and deeper water. And she found a decrease among those that are favored by fast flow. So this is an indication of that things are going in the right direction. And this was not even a, a comparison of restored and channelized. It was a comparison between enhanced restored and basic restored. So we, we see that we get a better result if we do this enhanced restoration with big boulders and things. If there is fish in the stream, they will very quickly find the spawning grounds because large fish tend to move quite long distances along the streams and then they can spawn and they found the spawning ground. If there is not any fish in the stream, we never know how long it takes until some fish eventually find their way there. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.